Thanks for having me. Um, I want to introduce you today to a few scenarios uh, which concern all of us. It's the, it's the urban planet. An urban planet that brings us back into the real, I would say. Into the real world. We heard already about it. This is the view from outside, the explorer's view. But as we looking at the details of the greater picture, we actually find out that it is cities, paradoxically, where we all live, that we, were, that we know very little about. So what are these cities? What's happening there? Uh, who is living there? What looks like a blue planet has actually long stopped to be a planet of water, but it's a planet of people today, you could say. And where are these people? Uh, they're actually living mostly still in medium-sized cities. Those mega cities of the southern hemisphere are still the exceptions. However, uh, one thing is for sure, uh, while we still talk about carbon credits uh, and about abstract constructions of technology, it's about the people, stupid. Um, we can translate all big topics of today, be it the environment, be it the carbon credits, the energy, the water, etc., etc., to this um, common denominator. Uh, what you see here is on Harvard Bridge in Calcutta, probably one of the most urban experiences that you can imagine. And as we stand here, 380 million more people are moving into urban centers around the world. But who are these people? Where are they coming from? And where the heck will 380 million people live? This is about 20 Mumbais or Sao Paulo's more that we have to accommodate uh, somewhere. South America in that sense is very interesting because it's the most urbanized subcontinent uh, in the world. Uh, in Caracas, where our office is, about 87% already live in cities. They already live in urban environments. And um, we have found that as this phenomena of urbanization is widely discussed, there are very few people who really do something about it. It is a, it is a discussion that stayed on the strata of discussing the effects and the phenomenology of it, but there are very little projects. So um, we have founded the Urban Think Tank in Caracas. I'm talking about Alfredo Brillenburg, my partner, uh, and a big team of uh, volunteers, and we work mostly for free. This is a very interesting model, but I can guarantee you it brings you a lot of clients. Um, <laughs> those clients mostly don't have the money to pay for projects, and what we have found also is that um, uh, we find these uh, more and more isolated groups that are not on the scanner of any big organization, of any uh, uh, business plan, uh, namely the old, disabled, uh, fringe groups, uh, etc., etc., uh, and they are not accounted for, but they actually f uh, cons constitute today the large majority. And they are, like in the real world, one could say, uh, fenced out. So this political equator that I showed at the very beginning, a phrase that is coined by Teddy Cruz, a good friend of ours who works in uh, Tijuana, is actually separating what was once east and west into a world which is now north and south. And this separation seems to be final. If there wouldn't be some uh, intelligent people and some thinkers, like for instance Eric Hobsbawm, who said already a while ago that uh, if we want to have a recognizable future, uh, our, uh, our path will be social distribution and not growth. So um, how does growth or social distribution look like? Well, in a city like Caracas, and you probably have seen those images, it looks pretty much like that. Uh, we have a housing shortage of 2 million units, 
and the government and private enterprise manages about the, uh, constructing 50 to 80,000 a year. Uh, that means at that rate, it will take us about 40 years to cover alone the, the lack of housing that we have today. But uh, squatters and uh, urban citizens have become smarter. The skyscraper, which was standing in the 20th century as the symbol of power, has become a squat as well. This, for instance, is the Torrecon Finanza, a former back, uh, bank building that has been invaded by 2,500 people uh, who just uh, made their living inside there. And there are uh, infinitive, infinitive other models that we are looking at and studying at um, uh, around the city, like this housing um, uh, uh, project. Once the, the, the star of social housing in South America, built for 55,000 people, houses today 120,000 people, simply by invading the modernist ground plan with informal housing. So this is what uh, it was set out to be, and this is what it is today. And surprisingly, as uh, formal systems slowly informalize um, and informal systems slowly formalize, we have actually found a new city. And uh, our findings have been uh, presented in the book that we have um, actually published with the Munich uh, Print House Prestel. Um, uh, they told us at the beginning that we have to come up with a fund for it ourselves. The Bundeskulturstiftung helped us with it because it was thought that the book will never sell. So we actually paid the entire book with sponsor money. Uh, if you go to Amazon today, you can buy an original copy for 500 euros. It's not available anymore. Unfortunately, we have not managed to reprint. Uh, what you find in the book is actually our fascination about a city that has uh, four times doubled its size alone in the last century. So this phenomena uh, you can equally see in Sao Paulo, Mexico City, etc. South America is, as I explained to you, uh, the area that we have most uh, intensively studied. But uh, what is happening in those cities is this new style of living. And we believe it's not an exception, uh, because the exception really is you guys. Uh, this is the rule. The larger part of the urban uh, inhabitants of the world live in that way, and they have to figure out how to survive. So um, we made for the Biennale in Venice uh, four years ago uh, a poster series, and this is one of them. And uh, it is actually a quote that we have uh, uh, heard di directly. You can read the one on the screen. Another one was that Marguerite Moreno is actually working with us. She's a c community activist. She said, if you talk about our city here, here, who will really believe you? Who will believe you how we live? And how do people live? Uh, this is a time lapse of the city of Caracas overlaid with the growing uh, barrios, the slum areas as they called there, favelas, uh, bidonvilles, however you want to name them. And today, 60% of the inhabitants living on 30% of the land in settlements like that. So the reality, as uh, powerful such images might look to you, is actually global. This urban planet uh, is actually spanning its sphere of intervention, just like in this picture, separated by a concrete wall. Many people think that's a photo montage, but this is actually in Paraisopolis. I show it here in the project we are doing there at the moment. A concrete wall is separating wealth from poverty, rich from poor. But the situation is not that clean and that clear, because as you can see here, you have a few uh, um, SUVs from some drug dealers who also park on that side, and the interaction between the two cities is actually very close. We say every good neighborhood needs actually its slum, its favela area. And we have founded in Columbia University in New York the Slum Lab, the Sustainable Living Urban Model Lab. This lab um, went a long way. Um, Alfredo and I are now teaching in, um, the, at the ETH, at the Swiss Institute of Technology, urban design at a chair that was newly created for these phenomena. And uh, it's worthwhile to look a little bit at the normality of the city of the South. So again, what hits you with CNN and with uh, uh, news lines on the, on the papers is something that goes on all the time in South America, in Southeast Asia and in Africa. So this is the daily bread of people. This is 
their self-built, actually the largest self-constructed environment uh, for housing are slum areas next to gated communities and suburbs. Uh, but often people are driven out by fires, by crime. Uh, this is actually shot holes uh, in the night. Gangs are shooting, uh, have shootouts at that wall and during the daytime the kids are playing around there. And Caracas has the questionable, um, uh, the questionable a prime situation that it was named the most dangerous city in the world. And I put this image up uh, because Munich, in Tyler Brule's observation, is the, the nicest, the best city in the world. So that would mean that I'm living in the worst city in the world. Um, I, I'm actually quite defensive about that idea because, um, believe it or not, and I invite you to visit Caracas, there are amazing pioneers living there and they're actually building a new city that should be relevant for all of us because it's the bottom of the pyramid and probably most of the young professionals also sitting here in this auditorium will in one way or the other work with those people. But again, let's look at the territory because at the core of everything is our understanding of property and land. Uh, as you probably know, if you ever bought an apartment or a house, uh, most of the money is invested in the land. I think this is no news for somebody who looks for an apartment in Munich. Uh, in Caracas, for instance, um, barrios or slum areas have been drawn in in city maps as zona verde, that means green zone. After intensive mapping, and you remember, uh, with no taxation, there's no representation, and therefore also no benefits, it turned out that actually most of the people live in those areas. This is Petare Norte, and only in this patch in the north, down here you have a subway station, you have about 200,000 people. And that's how it looks in real terms. So, as there's a revolution going on in Venezuela, we thought that's a good idea. But we believe in a revolution by design. And uh, we think that uh, uh, we don't uh, repeat uh, neo-colonial patterns by teach people music, like the lady before, or uh, technologies to uh, create a better, more sustainable, but from a cultural and from an appropriate point of view, more sustainable environment. So each of those icons actually stands for uh, a different project, and um, we believe in the creation of those projects actually in an analysis uh, and in a process-driven approach to uh, work in such environment. That means projects usually take a lot of time, uh, years, there's no uh, quick route, and we develop projects uh, without a budget. We develop them uh, need-based, and when the project is ready, we look for the funds. Just like here, this is a project we developed with the Austrian-Swiss cable car firm Doppelmayr Garaventa. It's a, a project in the uh, barrio of San Agustin. Uh, San Agustin is an area of 40,000 people. You can imagine a middle-sized soccer stadium. People usually uh, uh, roll their eyes and there's 40,000 people, but in each of those houses you have, uh, in average, 3.5 people uh, uh, who live there. Uh, that can be seven in one house and only one in the next, but uh, the average is 3.5, which adds up to 40,000 people. And how do they navigate around on this mountain? Uh, they're using stairs. So um, stairs are quite nice, but when the rainy season starts, they look like that. So you can imagine that it is quite complicated uh, to uh, move up and down on that hill. People are inventive. Uh, their groceries is actually uh, slide down the hill. These guys are actually delivering groceries to houses and they have a ramp and they bring it from the top to the bottom. But if you want to go from the city, from the valley up, you have to use the stairs. So there was a good idea, let's say a well-intended idea, to build a road in that mountain. So San Augustine finally got its access, its access road. However, uh, when people realized that that access road would tear down 30% of the houses, there was a big resistance against this uh, generally good intended project. So together with Doppelmayr, uh, we uh, uh, promoted this idea of a cable car, not only because it's cheap, uh, it is also almost surgically in its intervention. There are only masts and stations. And uh, we created a couple of imaginary scenarios what those stations could be. 
So this stands at the beginning of a project that we're working out where different groups, uh, think tanks, work on the topic of a particular station, in this case a station which has an auditorium uh, included in this new, um, in this new hot spot on the, on the fringe of the hill. And you can see the, the idea was to connect with the public transport at the bottom of the hill. This is the city. We have a highway and a river separating San Agustin from the city. And we proposed three stations on the top. Um, of, the, of the mountain. The project was very much criticized because it was not a cheap project. Um, but as I explained to you, our design process is need-based. We don't look at the budget from the beginning. However, we are interested in, a, in an appropriate response. Uh, it, at the end, the project was actually a great prototype, an experiment, an experiment, an experiment that is repeated today in many other cities in South America and in Asia, and uh, it is running since more than a year now. Um, the, each of the stations on the top has a particular topic. One of them, which is this one, is for enjoyment. This is the first time that people from the city move into the slum just to go up there and see the city from the top. Uh, you celebrate your 1st of January there, or you go with your loved ones and you have a date up there. The first time that anybody who didn't live in San Agustin even dared to put a foot down there. And we have a couple of other stations. The middle one, indicated with the yellow dot, is a, a sports infrastructure. And the, one, the following one on the right is this music uh, installation. And I, I show you that a little bit later. So as we go through the mountain, over the mountain, i just show you some quick shots uh, to explain it a little bit better. Um, you, you see that this system um, is transporting today uh, 3,000 people per hour up and down, which makes a, di a huge difference in the life of the, of the people. And uh, I can tell you, apart from being a very potent and powerful transport system, uh, driving with a cable car is also a lot of fun. So um, uh, as we developed these uh, social infrastructures along the cable car, you see here again the different stations, the valley station where you can go right into the subway system. Um, uh, here two people boarding, boarding the, the cable car, arriving in the, in the city. Uh, the, this cable car has actually become a sort of a, a new trademark for the city. So what used to be, what used to be the most uh, derogative area of town, San Agustin, nobody would even have dared to, to tell somebody that he's from there, has become a landmark. And I'll leave you with a few pictures uh, how the thing looks today as people move up and down and, let's say, um, having an impact on their life through the work of design and designers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.